And uh, so just take a minute. And if you'd like to read along, you can. It's on the bottom of page three. Otherwise, just listen. So starting with verse 18. Though you lack what you need and are constantly disparaged, afflicted by dangerous sickness and spirits, without discouragement, take on the misdeeds and pain of all living beings. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. How might we use deprivation on the path? Based on what you already know from your own wisdom, from your previous studies, what is the way to take deprivation on the path? And verse 19, though you become famous and many bow to you and you gain riches equal to Vashra see the worldly fortune is without essence and be unconceited. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. Switching it around, how do we use prosperity on the path? Using your own life experience using your prior study, what is the way to use prosperity? While the enemy of your own anger is unsubdued, though you conquer external foes, they will only increase. Therefore, with the militia of love and compassion, subdue your own mind. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. How do we take hatred on the path? And finally, sensual pleasures are like salt water. The more you indulge, the more thirst increases. Abandon at once those things which breed clinging attachment. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. How do we use desire on the path? And so then think whatever happens, happiness or suffering, what I want or what I don't want, may everything be fuel for practice, developing my mind, bringing happiness to myself and others.
So um, we're going to look at four verses um, today in the first half of the class, and then we're going to finish concentration. We're going to get ready to look at ultimate bodhicitta and emptiness. Verses um, that follow verses 22, 23, 24 are all going into ultimate truth. And then we have the six perfections, and then we finish with um, the perfection of wisdom. So it's coming up in the verses as well. So, so today we're going to look at using um, uh, deprivation and prosperity using hatred and desire yeah so you know they're of a similar type these verses but um if we want to start by looking at verse 18 yeah at the bottom of page three so verse 18 says though you lack what you need and are constantly disparaged yeah afflicted by dangerous sickness and spirits without discouragement take on the misdeeds and the pain of all living beings. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So we start with just the general teaching on patience that you already know, which is what are the good qualities of suffering? Yeah, what are the good qualities of suffering? For example, uh, it dispels arrogance, right? One of the very good qualities of suffering is it's very difficult to look down on others when you're going through a struggle. Yeah, um, when things are going well, when you feel competent, when you feel everyone is in harmony around you, when you feel professionally successful, it's just very human and natural to look down on people who don't have their act together. Um, so suffering is a good quality that it dispels arrogance. It evens the playing field. You feel the human connection of the human experience more richly when you're suffering. So this is from the patient section of the Lam Rim, right? Um, so we reflect on the positive qualities of suffering. Um, then we reflect on the positive qualities of helping us become brave, that whatever hardship we've experienced in the past has a direct relationship to the amount of resilience we have now. So without hardship, there would be no resilience. That resilience is something about ourselves that we very much value, both for our own sake and our ability to help others. So you just, you know, you're starting with the, the basic reflections of patience, and then you go deeper into, I can expand my courage and I can expand my capacity to bring down my arrogance by not only taking on my own present day suffering, but the suffering of my whole life to come, as well as the suffering of everyone in my life and the suffering of all sentient beings, psychologically, right? Because you're not actually doing it, are you? Right? You're not actually thinking of all the rest of the suffering you're going to experience in your life. Yeah, the sufferings of old age, the sufferings of grief and loss, the sufferings of losing physical strength. So, you know, I mean, imagine it. There's just a lot of suffering to come, right? You're not actually able to drag it all into the present and giving it to yourself in this moment. But by psychologically doing that, it increases your capacity for bravery. Yeah, by thinking I don't want just my own suffering, which I find useful and productive, I want the suffering of all sentient things. It again kind of just like makes you straighten your shoulders. Yeah, it makes you like ready to take it. You know, you've prepared yourself for the battle with your afflictions. You've prepared yourself for having an open heart in response to hardship so that it becomes more resilient, more connected, etc., etc. And you're doing it within the safety of your own little meditation cushion, quiet, peaceful at home, with nothing particularly going wrong in this second. Right? So don't misunderstand. It's not like you're inviting all the tragedies that could ever be into this moment. You're psychologically imagining it to be the case to build your fortitude. Yeah, so that's the next step. And then the deepest step is then to actually engage in Tonglen practice, um, riding on the breath, gradually, gradually, gradually. So it just starts with these kind of, you know, mental exercises of however much you're coping with in this moment, you are coping. How much more could you cope with? A lot more, actually. And would there even be a benefit to that? Of course there would, if you were oriented the right way, if you made it important enough to do so. Yeah, if you knew that it had a direct relationship in your ability to benefit others, you could bear so much more than you're bearing now. So 
you know, it's using deprivation in a useful way and, you know, afflicted by dangerous sickness and spirits. Um, it's the commentary talks about how if you're motivated with bodhicitta, you actually aren't harmed in the same way by afflictions and suffering as you are without bodhicitta. Right? When you're thinking the purpose of my life is to be of benefit to all sentient beings by becoming enlightened, then everything's in the correct perspective. Yeah, and you can even, you can think, whatever happens, I'm not going to retaliate. I'm got, not going to meet harm with harm. So then you become like one of these people who um, becomes actually like medicine for the others that harm you. The example in the text is, you know, of a great yogi who's, um, uh, you know, in the forest and spirits want to harm him and he sees that the spirits are just hungry and that's why they're so badly behaved. And he says, well, I don't have any food to give you, but I can give you some of my own flesh. And because his flesh is so imbued with his mind of bodhicitta, the spirit becomes satiated and no longer is greedy and harmful. You know, there's stories in um, the Christian tradition about beings like this as well. Saints like St. Francis of Assisi, for example, had so much love and compassion that it subdued um, a wolf who was going into the nearby village and eating children just by the presence of St. Francis. It was able to calm the level of agitation of the area. So it's not like you're changing anyone, but it's that by the power of your compassion, you're able to bring out better and better aspects of the other. As soon as you're self-motivated and full of self-cherishing, that just kind of ricochets and boomerangs and brings out more of that in others. So you start with feeling deprived and hard done by and misunderstood and disrespected, and you identify with that and that attracts even more of it. Yeah. It's like neediness becomes a bottomless pit. Yeah, and you never feel satisfied. So a deprivation mentality will make you feel poor even when you have plenty. So, so that's a, a, what this verse is talking about. And then the other side, verse 19, is talking about how... Okay. Yeah, yeah. If I can ask about this uh, verse... Sure. Okay. Is it uh, is it right or 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 true uh, to think about uh, the idea that when you suffer uh, or sick or you you take uh, you take some of the suffering, some of the problems, some of the suffering. Uh, that exists in the world and you accept it. So you carry it from, for others. Is it, is it um, a, 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 an idea that, 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 that makes sense? That... It, it's like it arrives at that point, you know, but it's not like you can take the suffering of the world or carry the suffering of one aspect of the world and yet you can by taking responsibility for your own response to your own suffering so by taking responsibility for your own response to hardship then that hardship that is landed here you're yeah. taking care of in a way that's useful but, but, and that but, is a benefit but in the in this uh, spiritual sense is it right that when you're taking uh, you accept to take uh, on yourself some suffering. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, yored, no? uh, the, the, the it's decreased. It's decreased from amount of decrease, decrease amount of suffering from the others. Is it, is it, um... it's, it is like that and it isn't. It's like, it's less direct than what you're describing, but it amounts to the same thing. It's, it's that by taking responsibility for yourself as a condition for the situation of other people, then you're not adding to the suffering situation of other people. You know, other people are a condition for our suffering all the time, right? They're not the substantial cause, but they are definitely a condition. 
right? Absolutely, they're a condition. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, if we think that they are a substantial cause, we disempower ourselves. The other way around, we are a condition for other people's suffering. We might not even realize how much we're a condition for other people's suffering, but we are. So if, if we realize that a big piece of that is that we react badly when we suffer, and reacting badly when we suffer means that we're a sort of person more likely to be a negative condition for others, that's an important self-knowledge that makes you consciously react to your own suffering differently. I understand, but it's, it's, it is not in the Christian way that you are carrying the suffering of others. It's not, it's not the, the same Depends way. on what question you ask. Right. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, there's this like infinite interconnectedness. So in a way, yes, what you say is true in the sense of like interconnectedness, but it's not so direct of here's some suffering existing out yeah. there take that bit and carry it with me so no one else has to. Yes. It doesn't work that way. No. no. Yeah. But, but you can think, say there's a difficult person who is very critical or very unkind or betrays others, and they do that to you as opposed to someone else. You can think, all right, they had that behavior. That is a behavior they had. I'm glad they did it to me because I have the capability and resilience to cope you know, rather than them doing it to someone else. You can think in that way. Um, it, yeah, it's delicate because we, we want to take this like universal responsibility. Yes, that's um, While mean. not taking any responsibility. It's paradoxical. Yeah, it's like absolute responsibility without any responsibility. Because <laughs> right? we don't have control over all the conditions, right? We are con in control of ourselves as a condition but us on our very worst day, in our worst mood, with our worst behavior, could still wind up being a condition that is positive for someone else if their head is in the right space, right? So it's not like it's like so cut and dry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so these verses are really about this inner mentality of if you identify as deprived, you will feel deprived. And deprivation begets deprivation begets depri deprivation. And it relates very much to the verse on desire, verse 21, which is sensual pleasures are like salt water, right? The more you indulge, the more your thirst increases. So when your mind has become full of hunger, deprivation, neediness, or has become full of craving, grasping, desire, want, it will never be satisfied. It will never be satisfied. It will never be enough. No matter if you get everything you ever wanted, then you'll want more, you know? And we know this from our life already. So we're looking at it from two perspectives, whether you're in the, you know, give me, give me, I'm full of, I have a big hole in my heart that needs to be filled, or um, in the, you know, grabbing, grabbing, chasing, chasing, you know, if I get this substance, if I get this person, if I get this situation, then I'll be happy illusion, lie that we tell ourselves. So if you can notice deprivation and say, absolutely everything is fuel for my path, what is the fuel this is supposed to be? The fuel deprivation is supposed to be is to give me courage and bravery. Yeah. And then when I have prosperity, when everything is going well, when life is happy and harmonious, it's so natural to become like a God realm being who just enjoys and uses up all their merit and forgets about the suffering of others and becomes separated from society and the problems of society and just becomes a mindless consumer full of entitlement. That's what normally happens with prosperity. Yeah, is that it just encourages this type of arrogance, entitlement mentality. And so instead of that, we say, we want to be brave, but we don't want to be arrogant. So if you go too far into bravery, it turns into arrogance. Yeah. So how do we use when things are going well to remain in touch with the suffering of the world while still enjoying our resources? You know, because both of these verses are saying, you're allowed to be happy. <laughs> you can be happy when you're deprived. You can be happy when you're prosperous, right? You're allowed to be happy because it's your mind. Yeah, but your afflictions are telling you you need these criteria for inner peace and you rob yourself of joy.
Never mind enlightenment, just daily joy. I have a question. Yeah. In, in the verse itself, verse 18, it doesn't talk about courage and uh, bravery. It, it, it's, it thinks that you add about it. Uh, uh, this is the fuel or uh, because the Bodhisattva needs many things for aspiration and motivation and, and you add uh, this to the courage, why? Um, I don't add it. Um, it's in the verse and it's in the commentary. Yeah, the verse is, yeah, without discouragement, take on the misdeeds. To take on the misdeeds requires courage, right? Um, to oh, take I, on I didn't, okay, I didn't understand the, the, okay, without discouragement, take on the, okay. Yeah. So it's first just establishing the premise. When this is what's happening, what do you do? But first, what is happening? You know, what are all the things related to deprivation? When you lack what you need, obvious deprivation, right? But also when you're constantly disparaged, right? When people are looking down on you and talking down to you and criticizing you and not giving you respect and you feel deprived of validation, deprived of human connection, deprived of, re of respect, you know, when it's that state of affairs. Also, when you feel deprived of health, right? Physical health, when you feel like you're um, being attacked by sickness or being attacked by spirits, that kind of deprivation, there, setting the premise, then your response is to be without discouragement. Without discouragement, take on the misdeeds. By saying without discouragement, it's naming that discouragement is natural. Right? right in the verse, by naming without discouragement, it's saying, of course, normally, when any of these things happen, we get depressed. Of course we do. It's only normal. It's only natural. Instead of that, take on the misdeeds and the pain of all living beings. You say, not just my own, give me everyone's. It gives you fortitude. It really does. And it's counterintuitive, but like all things related to Tonglen, if you just experiment, you feel the heart open. You know, I, you know, I was thinking about how um, I used to ride my mountain bike in the mountains with um, these, uh, these ladies that were mountain bike addicts. And they were much older than me. I was like 15 and they were in their 50s. And um, I had my backpack while I was riding up the mountain and I was getting so tired because I was out of shape. And one of these much older women said, oh, I'll carry your backpack for you as well as my own. And when she had double the amount of weight, she went twice as fast. It was like by looking after me, it gave her even more power and even more joy. And I just remember being so bewildered, you know, thinking, well, now she's carrying twice as much. How is she going so much faster? This is crazy. But it was this first little taste of when it's not about you, energy opens up. Yeah, so she had a hardship. She had to carry a big heavy back pack up a mountain on a mountain bike, just like me. But then taking on mine, she had more energy. We all have experiences like this. When it's not just for us, we can stretch. And then all of our stuff falls into the correct perspective and is no longer unbearable. But if you're only thinking of your own problems, it, they become all there is in the world. And, they, and you suffer from them so much more than when you think of the suffering of all of humanity. And it doesn't seem true until you try it and then you feel better. Yeah, and not only do you feel better, you're more effective and you're less hell to live with, yeah. Yeah, I mean, have, uh, we, we all notice this with the current situation. If people make this situation all about them and their deprivation, I can't go do the things I want. I can't go to the restaurants I like. I can't see the family members I want to see. I can't, I can't. Then they get more and more grumpy and more and more depressed. As soon as we think none of us can do what we want, <laughs> none of us get to go to the restaurants we want or see all the people we want to see or do all the things we want to do, you lighten up. <laughs> Right? When you realize it's not all about you, you lighten up. Do you agree? Even though it's counterintuitive, even though in the moment of self-cherishing, it's the last thing you want to think, when you actually do it, you kind of go, oh, right, what a relief. None of us can. Okay.
Do you agree? Or are you, you the, challenging the whole premise? Let's say, let's say, you know, like an interpretation of uh, what we call transformed interpretation or wisdom interpretation. So when you are talking to, to the patients and stuff, something that goes on and said, that's how it is like in, in life or for human beings or etc. So you are enlarging the spectrum for both of you. So this gives, it takes, it, it takes, uh, it gives some power, you know, some, but power not in the meaning of your ego, but for your wings, it, it widens your wings or something like this. So we're doing it actually a lot with not articulating it like this, but it's the same idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it works, you know, and it's delicate because, I mean, it's, it's a conversation in Buddhism that we have with ourselves. It's not a conversation that we communicate to other people specifically so directly because the last thing a suffering person wants to hear is it's not all about you. Right? That's the last thing a suffering person wants to hear, unless they're well trained, unless they already have space for that conversation. You don't communicate that in words, but for us as, as practitioners or people familiar with these concepts, reminding ourselves of that can immediately make us drop the story and the importance of the story of our life and our suffering. You know, and, and of course, even deeper than that is then to see the illusory nature of it and go into the emptiness of it. But this is still in the relative of everything that is happening can be useful. I don't have to think of anything as an obstacle. Even if I call it nominally an obstacle, it's not fundamentally an obstacle from its own side. How do I use whatever's happening? Because the main habit I want to develop in my life is that mental attitude. Yeah, everything is useful. How is this moment useful? Happiness, suffering, boredom, ambiguity, neutrality, those things too. Maybe our lives aren't that dramatic. Maybe we're not spiking between despair and excitement. Maybe we're living in neutral or something. Even that can be useful if we lean into it and investigate it and ask, how will this keep my heart open? How will this continue to help me connect to the human condition? So, you know, so we're marching around these ideas from all different angles because it'll make it sink in and then kick in when we need it to, you know? And so when we look at um, the prosperity verse, you know, in a way it's harder to use good for the spiritual path. When things are going well, when things are easy, there's not the same impetus to ask ourselves, what's the deeper spiritual meaning? We just enjoy it, right? You just kind of live in indulgence until it wears out and hope that it'll never end, even though, even though it always has. Right? Even though all of your life has shown you when things are going well, it's temporary, still we hold out hope that there is some sort of stability. Yeah, because we forget impermanence and our, you know, attachment drives. So, you know, so you kind of go back and forth. And this is talking more about when the external situation is provoking, then it moves into when your internal situation is provoking with hatred and desire. And, you know, hatred is easier to see the negative aspect of because it's uncomfortable. Desire, when it's getting what it wants, feels like pleasure. And you don't even notice how much suffering it is until it stops getting what it wants, which is why it's different than love, right? So when you look at the anger verse, the enemy, well, the enemy of your own anger, yeah, the enemy of your own anger is unsubdued. Though you conquer external foes, they will only increase, right? So in, until we get a handle on hatred, we will keep having enemies. Yeah, until we deal with our own negative states of mind, we will find people problematic, disagreeable, and won't want them around us, you know? So the militia to fight this enemy is love and compassion, which you know, which we've known and you knew before Buddhism, you know, but it's just reminding ourselves of even very difficult people wouldn't disturb our inner peace if we were armored with love and compassion. And we know that it's true because it's worked before. Yeah, when you're just completely filled with love and compassion, even for a few minutes, a very difficult person doesn't have the power to disturb your inner peace. Yeah, so, so these are powerful verses, but 
you know, um, the sensual pleasure is like saltwater one. This is my favorite verse. I used to have it like written out in beautiful calligraphy and like stuck on my refrigerator door for years. <laughs> it was just like on the fridge. Um, you know, it's my favorite verse because it's my biggest problem. And there's a really cool part in the commentary that says, of course, scratching an itch feels like pleasure, but it's far greater pleasure not to have a skin disease, right? And that's what desire is like. It's like scratching the itch. It's the pleasure you get from scratching the itch. It seems like pleasure, right? But it would be far more pleasure if you just didn't have a skin disease. So, you know, so this is something that we have to come back to again and again to get rid of clinging attachment, to break the spell, right? To break the spell of attachment because it'll just keep trying to tempt us in a million different ways with a, diff a million different situations. And until we kind of feel the nature of attachment within our own mind, we'll fall into the same old patterns we always have in slightly different forms, maybe more socially acceptable, maybe more, I don't know, sophisticated, but it's the same old bloody attachment. It's the same old addictive mind. We just have permission for some forms and not permission for others, but it's the same problem. And if we let it be, we'll never get out of samsara. Yeah. So um, those are those four. Um, I'm guessing they're pretty self-evident given what you guys already know about Lo Zhang teachings, but did you have any additional thoughts or um, questions about those ones? I really like 19. You, uh, maybe I didn't hear, but I didn't hear you talk a lot about it. Maybe I missed it. Uh, yeah, it's great, yeah. Yeah, it's great. I'm kind of skimming through these four. They all warrant a whole retreat, you know. <laughs> Any one of these verses could be its own retreat. But what, what do you like about it? It, it? On the first, on the surface, it doesn't touch the, the misery or the pain. It seems like the fortune of being uh, famous or, and, and how tricky it can be that it can become a uh, a misery or a misuse of the wisdom or the uh, opportunity to be of help for people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, to be unconceited, yeah, to forsake pride. Um, when you gain riches equal to Vaishravarana, this is the god of wealth. Um, in the Hindu tradition, it would be Kubra. In the Buddhist tradition, it's Namtose or Zambala. And uh, he's depicted as um, really, really fat, heavy, heavy with qualities, yeah, heavy with riches. And he has great big bulging eyes. And he's holding a mongoose, which is an animal that loves shiny things and loves to accumulate. And so it's kind of like um, the image of attachment in order to get rid of attachment. Um, but he's known as the Lord of Wealth, right? So um, related to the Ratnas and Baba Buddha family. Um, and so just imagine what if you had everything you ever wanted, plus all of the riches of the God of wealth, right? Of the Buddha of prosperity. What if you were that rich, right? You would, if you were a Buddha, you would see that worldly fortune is without essence, right? Otherwise, rich people would be happy, right? <laughs> right? Are rich people happy because of their riches? I'm sure it gives them some pleasure, but uh, do they seem any more happy than people that are middle class? I don't, I don't know. The rich people I know don't seem any happier. And yet when you're not rich, you think if you're rich, you'll be happier. It's a big fat lie, right? Right, and the economy can crash at any point. You know, it's ephemeral, it's temporary. Yeah, it's an illusion of stability. And yet when you have it, um, it's very easy to forget about the sufferings of those without. Yeah. So when they say that, you know, Buddhists want, you know, want you to live in an austere way without too many possessions, to live simply, it doesn't mean without the basics of daily needs. It doesn't mean without shelter. It doesn't mean without food. But it means without all of this project for more. You know, it's almost like a hobby for us to think of what more could we need. Yeah, we almost cultivate our need as if it's some sort of joy and uh, forget how much that robs us of peace. And so you just remind yourself of the deep contentment that you've had in the past, those times when you've allowed life to simplify. Yeah, 
Can I, I mean, just think of those times when maybe you were camping or maybe you were in between houses or maybe this or maybe that, but sometime when life just, the details became simpler, when it became slower and your needs were less for whatever reason, the huge peace and empowerment that comes from those times. If we can remember that, then the next time we're on a shopping binge or a person binge or a, I don't know, next degree binge or whatever your binge is, the temptation is less. It's also important for us, the, uh, the difference between idealization and grandiose needs because you can be rich, but use it in a way that is not grandiose. It's not the richness that is bad or good by itself. It's what yep. you do with the, the power that you have and the ability to do with it. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I was talking about rich in terms of praise and reputation, right? That we, we seek so much sort of, I don't know, professional standing or familial respect or whatever these kind of things are as if they are happiness. Forgetting why do people praise us? Is it really about us? <laughs> you know, I mean, how much of praise and validation and respect has anything to do with us, even if it's directed at us? You know, and yet we crave it as if it's some sort of foothold for stability and joy. It's not to say that, you know, some support from your friends isn't useful and good. It's, it's saying the craving is doing us a disservice. And once you get to that point where maybe you are celebrated in whatever community you occupy, it's in the nature of suffering because then you can start to want it and need it and depend on it, right? Once you have status, then you have the fear of losing status. Yeah, once you achieve the pinnacle of your career, then there's some young something on your tails about to overtake you or you get too old to be taken seriously, or, you know, it's the sufferings of cyclic existence. So it's also talking rich in terms of reputation. Of course, reputation from its own side is not good or bad. You can use reputation in a positive way, of course. This is talking about the craving that comes once you have it. Yeah, so if you can just have it, use it on the spiritual path, lose it, use it on the spiritual path, you know? All of it is useful, but it's the hunger and the hunt that's being objected to here. Yeah, okay, concentration. So um, now turning to page 33. Turn to page 33, um, the higher training in concentration and the perfection of meditative stability. So this is just kind of a summary to, to get us clarified about what we've been talking about with concentration, just so we don't get lost. Okay, so on page 33, it says, the higher training in concentration of the three higher trainings, right? The higher training in concentration is typically discussed in the context of the fourth truth, the true path. And the perfection of meditative stability is usually explained in the context of the six bodhisattva perfections emphasizing that it must be done with a bodhicitta motivation. However, they deal with the same topics, conducive conditions for cultivating serenity or calm abiding, observed objects, techniques to deal with hindrances and faults, and the attainment of serenity and higher meditative absorptions. Right, so it's, it's basically just saying it's the same topic, whether it's from the Theravadan tradition or the Mahayana tradition or the Tantric tradition, we're talking about the same thing. The difference is the motivation. And then the, re the rest of the, the reading is basically talking about how the word concentration is used in many different contexts.
So know what it's referring to when you're reading it. Could you, could you explain the differentiations in the motivation? Why the motivation is different? For um, the higher training in concentration as opposed to the perfection of concentration. The, the higher training of concentration is common to all forms of Buddhism. Yeah, Theravadan, Mahayana, Tantra, it's, everybody has the same idea about the higher training in concentration. Um, the higher trainings, you know, concentration, ethics, and wisdom. So this is the same concentration that you talk about in the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, that everybody agrees on. The difference in the Mahayana tradition is that that same concentration has to have a bodhicitta motivation, right? So you can have a concentration that is just trying to get out of samsara, right? Just trying to achieve nirvana. Um, and you can have concentration that is seeking to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So it's just two different reasons for the same practice, right? You could be watching the breath just to get through the day, or you could be watching the breath in order to become enlightened. You're still just watching the breath, but it's how you've launched yourself. Yeah. So this is just kind of a summary. And um, I think this is all stuff that you know, so I don't think we need to read the whole thing. But did you want to ask anything about the difference between the higher training and concentration or the perfection of concentration? Is it pretty clear? Yeah, the higher training is what we talked about before when we um, did the semester with the 12 links, et cetera, et cetera. Right now we're talking about the perfection. Hence the whole discussion on um, the seven limb prayer, et cetera, et cetera, that we went into. Okay, so page 35, um, training in the last two perfections from the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa. This um, handout is a review from previous semesters. So you would have seen this, this handout before. And it's just to review what do you meditate on and why. Yeah, so it's just having it all in one place so that when you're having stuff go on in your life, you know which technique to use for which affliction. Or if you're wanting a project for your spiritual path, you know how to orient yourself. So that's what this teaching is on. So the objects of meditation themselves. The Bhagavan stated that yogis have four types of objects of meditation. These being universal objects of meditation, objects of meditation for purifying your behavior, objects of meditation for expertise, and objects of meditation for purifying afflictions. All right, so that encompasses all the meditations we've ever done and will do fall into one of those four categories. Yeah, so the universal objects are basically insight, calm abiding, looking at relative truth or ultimate truth, and becoming free from dysfunctional tendencies um, by looking at the result. Yeah, just to quickly summarize. B, objects of meditation for purifying your behavior. Um, in the bold it says, these objects facilitate the stopping of attachment and such in those whose behavior is dominated by attachment and such. They are special objects of meditation because you may readily attain concentration based upon them. Yeah, so this is if you're particularly feeling a lot of attachment. These are the main strategies, the main five strategies to overcome attachment. Yeah, so meditating on ugliness or the disadvantages of the object of your meditation or object of your attachment, love, um, looking at equanimity and then developing the wish for the people to have happiness, looking at dependent arising. Um, differentiation of the six constituents, like when we did the four close placements of mindfulness, and then inhalation and exhalation of the breath. Yeah. So stop me at any point if I'm going too fast, but this should all be review, I think. Yeah, and you can read it all in depth if you want to go back to anything, but stop me if you want me to go over something again. Um, see objects of meditation for expertise. In the bold it says, these objects are conducive to the development of insight that knows emptiness, inasmuch as they refute a personal self that is not included among those phenomena. Therefore, they are excellent objects of meditation for cultivating serenity, calm abiding. Over the page, so then they have the five objects. So basically, 
the aggregates, the constituents, the sources, dependent arising in general, and what is and is not possible, like about karma. And then we have the category of purifying afflictions. Yeah, reducing the strength of the seeds of afflictions and utterly eradicating the seeds. So this is your purification section. And then on page 38, Kamala Sheila's second stages of meditation states that objects of meditation are three. After you've brought together everything that all 12 branches of scripture say about determining, settling into, and having settled into reality, you stabilize the mind upon it. Two, you observe the aggregates, etc., which include phenomena to some extent. So we're going to go into those two in depth when we do emptiness, because that's referring to insight meditation. So, you know, just put a little star, those we're going to come back to. And then the third one is to stabilize your mind on the physical form of the Buddha. So this stabilizing the mind on the physical form of the Buddha is something that we've talked about in and out different semesters um, as one of the best objects of single pointed meditation. Do you remember why it's the best object for single pointed meditation as opposed to like a flower or the moon or a candle or something like that? Do you remember why it, it's suggested? Maybe because it symbolizes all the good qualities that we aspire to have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, you know, if you jump to page 41, it'll go into that a bit more in depth. So, so flip forward a few more pages, page 41. Yeah. And then we jump down to be identifying objects of meditation for this context. Okay, so it says, now from among the many objects of meditation I've explained, on which object of meditation should you base yourself so as to achieve serenity, calm abiding? As stated in the sutra passage cited above, there is no single definite object. Individuals require their particular object of meditation. So it's saying, choose what works for you, right? Choose what works for you, stabilize on it, you know, learn a lot of techniques, but then in your own daily practice, just, you know, simplify nice and straightforward. But um, over the page on 42 at the top, it says, if you are a person of balanced behavior or a person with slight affliction, then as explained before, make your meditative base, whichever objects of meditation explained above most appeals to you. Yeah. So basically, if you're not dominated by afflictions, if you're generally, you know, kind, peaceful, not very afflicted person, pick whatever you want. But if you're having big afflictions arise, address those first. Yeah, address those first. So um, at the bottom of the page, it says, in this regard, keep your attention on the physical form of the Buddha is to recall the Buddha, and it gives rise to limitless merit. When your image of that body is clear and firm, then there is a special intensification of your meditative focus on the field in relation to which you amass merit through prostration, offering, aspirational prayer, etc., meaning the seven limb prayer, as well as on the field in relation to which you purify obscurations through confession, restraint, etc. This kind of meditation serves many purposes over the page. As stated earlier on the extract from King of Concentration Sutra, it has advantages such as not losing your mindfulness of the Buddha as you die. And when you cultivate the mantra path, it heightens deity yoga. The sutra on the concentration which perceives the Buddha of the present face to face gives a very clear and detailed treatment of these benefits, as well as the method for directing your mind toward the Buddha. Therefore, you should definitely come to know them from there, as Kamala Sheila states in his stages of meditation. So what they're saying is that if you choose an object that is virtuous from the outset, even if you don't develop perfect concentration, you're still getting huge amounts of positive karma and positive associations with what that image represents. Yeah, so even if you never develop calm abiding in this life, it's not time wasted. Yeah. Now, if you focus only on the breath, it's neutral, right? 
And so if you never develop calm abiding, you know, you haven't developed a huge, vast array of merit. Of course, if you start it with a bodhicitta motivation, it's way better, right? If you start it with um, the seven limb prayer in bodhicitta, it's way better. But I think if we're a little bit honest with ourselves of how much is our path really going to progress in this life, maybe it's better to make a practice that's going to be beneficial, whether or not the specific result we seek comes in this life or not. What we want is positive associations with a spiritual path so that we keep meeting a spiritual path, so that we keep liking a spiritual path. So, you know, if, we, if we're doing a meditation object because we should or it's good, also we'll develop some sort of subtle rebellion or aversion to it. So we don't want to do that just because it's good to, but it's very important to choose a virtuous object and if you're very fond of meditating on the breath, it's fine and good, but to think of it more as a preliminary and then you know, go on to other objects that are more specifically virtuous, even if it's single pointed meditation on compassion, right? So you could do an analytical meditation on compassion, arrive at resonance with compassion, and then stay there without analysis, without a lot of extra anything, just hold steady on a concept like compassion. So if you don't wanna use the image of a Buddha, you don't wanna use a mental image at all, you can use a concept like compassion. You just work your way into resonance with it by starting with analysis first. Does that make sense? All right, so any of our analytical topics can be single pointed topics, but you have to touch it in order to stay there. You have to land on it in order for it to be a suitable object of meditation for concentration. Too fast? Maybe, no, good, moving on. I feel your need for emptiness. That's why I'm going quickly through concentration. Yeah, because emptiness is fun. Yeah, go on. It's, it takes time to absorb and to think, elaborate. It's okay, it's good. Keep going, we're coming back to thinking. Huh. Again, again, um, on page 44, there's just a little point I wanted to make sure that we all were really clear about just to prevent any mistakes. So um, starting at the top of page 44, it says, or seek your object of meditation by reflecting upon the meaning of the eloquent descriptions of the Buddha's form, which you have heard from your guru, and make this image appear in your mind. Furthermore, do not let the object of meditation have the aspect of a painting or sculpture. Rather, learn to have it appear in your mind with the aspect of an actual Buddha. Some set an image before them and immediately meditate on it while staring at it. The master Yeshide's rejection of this practice is excellent. He says that concentration is not achieved in the sensory consciousnesses, but in the mental consciousness. Thus, the actual object of meditation of a concentration is the actual object of mental consciousness, right? So, for example, when we have these, like, YouTube meditations of the Buddha, you're looking at a picture on a screen and looking at the details, looking at the shape and size, getting everything tidy, getting really clear, and then you shut your eyes and bring your memory of it to your mind's eye, right? So don't meditate by staring at anything. And also don't meditate thinking it's sensorial, like it has to be with your eyes, you know, like a magical hologram appearing in front of you, okay? It's, it's a memory of an image you bring to your mind of something that you've actually seen. But the thing that you've actually seen, you need to bring a sense of three-dimensional, real, made of light, you know? So really use your imagination and your creativity to give it life, yeah? Um, it's, it's easier to stabilize your mind on then more advanced practices if you do a very simple Buddha meditation somewhat regularly, right? If you're good at picturing Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front surrounded by golden light, yeah, because it's familiar, then when you do something like lower tantra or highest yoga tantra, your mind is more flexible and used to visualizing. And so when the visualizations get more elaborate, your mind is able to hold more and then imbue those images with more meaning. 
So, um, so as we go along, we're going to approach some, some tantric um, meditations just so you can experiment with the basic form of it and just see this idea of building a visualization and then imbuing it with meaning and then doing a mantra and seeing if you can hold these things simultaneously because this develops calm abiding and special insight simultaneously rather than as two separate projects. And because we already multitask so much in our daily life, it actually is a little bit more stimulating and entertaining for our worldly mind to do this kind of multi-tiered approach. So it might be that you actually focus better with more complexity because your mind is used to complexity. So this is what we're gonna um, experiment with on Wednesday. So um, your Wednesday meditation, um, I've recorded for you, but if you'd rather not listen to my voice, which is completely fine and understandable, um, the meditation on Manjushri is at the very back of the book. Yeah, so it's the Manjushri practice for developing the seven wisdoms. Um, we're gonna start experimenting with um, simplified tantric meditation in its structured formal form to just kind of see how you go calm abiding and insight together. Um, rather than as two separate projects. So um, sometime before we meet again on Wednesday, if you could do this Manjushri meditation, either walk your way through it, read it, visualize, read it, visualize, or um, listen to the video that I'll send you after class, whichever you prefer. But just have a go at it once to just kind of see, um, see how your mind reacts to this process. It'll be similar to a lot of what we've done in the past. Um, with Medicine Buddha and Tara, but this is the more formalized, structured version, less secularized, less simplified. So um, any kind of final thoughts or questions before we call it a day? Yeah, Manjushri meditation and um, read a little bit of 37 practices. Yeah, pages 85 to 90 in um, His Holiness's commentary on 37 practices. Yeah. So that's getting into the emptiness verses and they're interesting and it's nice to see what His Holiness says about them. Um, okay, cool. So we'll just take a minute and um, settle. Imagine everything digesting. Any wisdom that you've touched, pulling through into the rest of the day. and relaxing your attention. Okay, to the <laughs>